Have you ever had an idea, an ambition, opportunity that was enticing and interesting, but you weren't quite sure if it was the right opportunity for you? This could be a business, career, creative, ministry opportunity, and any other type of opportunity that's available that could come into your life. And while in the valley of decision, you end up doing nothing or you do a whole bunch of other things that don't actually move the needle towards your ultimate goal. I have definitely been there, but I've also been able to overcome this dilemma. So in this episode, me and my friend Sonia, who's a doctor, a songwriter, and just a prolific woman of God reigning from the continent of Africa, are going to break down three major revelations that will help you get clarity in this part of your life so that you can become free from decision paralysis. Vision. We said something in the last time we spoke that kind of was like a sticky statement. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea isn't always a God idea, but a God idea is always a good idea. That hit me in, in so mm -hmm. many ways, I think in a very profound way, because we also say this that many times a God idea does have characteristics that are crazy or that are out of your reach or out of the norm or something that mm -hmm. seems unattainable in your own strength sometimes, most of the times. And I probably think that's why we shun the God idea because it's something that, well, I don't think I can do this. I think I can pull this out. You know? Because the God idea requires dependence on God and surrender. Surrender yeah. and dependence to, to his ways, how you're going to go about it. And we also say last time that a God idea Sometimes could be a good idea. And I asked you that question as well. I said, how do you, is there any moment where we could have a God idea and a good idea mixed together, actually meshed together mm -hmm. and put into one idea? Or maybe is a God idea something that's completely, that I'm completely resistant to? Because I feel like sometimes yeah. when we when we talk about God's will, we're like, oh, God's will, not again, God's will, right. no. <laughs> like, he's like literally telling you, don't do what you want to do. I know what's best. I'm your heavenly father. You should do it. Like, probably like practically giving you orders. That's how I perceived God's will for a very long time. So sometimes I will admit, even till today, when I hear God's will, there's that inner resistance in me that it might not be what I want. Yeah, I yeah, let's let's stay here real quick. So, this is something that I personally have beef with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. As a believer, I have beef with it because like you said, when you hear that term or that phrase God's will, mm -hmm. for some reason, I don't know how it was woven into the fabric of teaching or biblical analysis or mm -hmm doctrine or theology that we like immediately assume a, a counter narrative yeah. to our original plans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe because in the Bible, you know, there are lots of stories of people trying to do one thing and God changes their life and makes them do something else, exactly. maybe, which is legitimate and fair mm -hmm. and which happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's a unfair assumption mm. and I think it could, I think, especially for a lot of young people who are trying to figure out or people who are just trying to figure out in general, you know, you could be young at heart mm -hmm. and trying to restart mm -hmm. of this messing with their decision making. And, and, and they end up in this position of decision paralysis yeah. and end up doing nothing, Yeah, which I think the enemy will love us to be in a place of doing nothing. Exactly. Right? <laughs> because when we have a good idea. Or when we want to do God's will, we automatically assume that I have to, anything that I want, that's not it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. Like, and I forget I about just, it. It's like, I forget about yeah. it. I really want to do this yeah, thing, yeah. but I want to do God's will. Exactly. Like, Ooh. Mm. They're completely, what's the word? Like there's a dichotomy between the two. Like they can't like coexist. Yeah, it's like binary. yeah, they're binary and, and antagonistic as well because it's where my desires. It's almost like my desires. If I raise my desires, then God's will or God's desires are automatically. And if God's desires are raised, then my desires will go down the scale. Yeah, right. Of which I don't. I'm not yeah. really sure if that's 100. Not always the case, like you say. It's not always the case. But sometimes, most likely, it is the case. 
Yeah. You know? And I think, I think that, and that's what I'm trying to kind of understand for myself mm -hmm. and for anyone that comes through any of anything that I'm doing, any programs or any podcast interviews or anything, mm -hmm. because I hear that question a lot. I'm just trying to figure out what God's will is for my life, or <laughs> I'm trying to determine which path to take, mm. or I'm trying to figure out what my purpose is, mm. like all these different things. Yeah. And personally, from all the research, the studying, the biblical reading I have done, mm. I think a lot of, oh, okay. So I did an episode mm. a little while back I forgot what it was called. I believe it was episode 103 or 104. Mm -hmm. And I said that you can't follow God's will until you understand your own. Ooh. Right? <laughs> and, wow. And I think I might have mentioned this before in our, in our conversation because I was like, if you're submitting yourself to God's will, mm. there has to be something to submit. Yeah. Right? There has to be something to surrender. To surrender, exactly. right? And I feel like a lot of believers just completely cancel out what they actually desire. Ooh, yeah. I heard a phrase today. I thought it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. What? <laughs> it, it shows that if you say anything, something confidently, people will follow. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God. The, so, and, and he's a great, I, I've read a lot of his books. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal coach, strategist, businessman. But yeah. uh, he said the stupidest thing I thought I've ever heard today. He said, you want what you want. And I was like, oh, okay. that I, I could see that. Okay, you desire what you desire. Yeah. But the whole premise behind it was like, usually when you say share something that you want, people ask you, well, why? Mm -hmm. Why do you want that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a fair question. I ask why all the time. Mm -hmm. And he was like, there is no reason you want it because you want it. And yeah. that is enough of a reason within itself. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever okay. heard. Okay. Okay. Yes. I, you know, I, I, yes, I know. Yes, I know. It is dumb because I don't know when somebody asks you or you ask somebody a question, you expect some form of deep transformational answer, which is what we expect. But sometimes it's just as simple as that. Like, or why, if somebody asks me, why, why do you love the color brown? Like, I love brown. It's my favorite color. Why do you love the color brown? Because I love it. And sometimes, maybe if someone gives you that answer, it's probably because they haven't searched deep enough as to why they want what they want or why they like that particular thing. But sometimes, before you get to the deep stuff, is something as simple as wanting it because you want it. And what you want is valid as well. So I kind of get wh what he was saying. It's... Sounds dumb yeah. because it's you, you hearing from a guru. That's why it sounded like, well, we expected more from you than this. But sometimes well, it is simple. I think it worked because he is a guru. Yes. I think if the average person said that, they're like, shut up. Like, what are you <laughs> I, know. Talking about? I know, I know. But because like, he has like some credibility, people are like, oh, you like, know, oh, that's yeah. a good point. I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I think I personally think that's a lazy answer. Mm -hmm. Be mm -hmm. And I, I do get it. Like someone asked, like I'm wearing a chain or whatever. Well, why are you wearing that chain? Yeah. Cause I, cause I like the chain. I thought it looked nice. I thought I liked it. Yeah. I, there's no, there's no, there is deep, no, you know, yeah, whatever. there's no, huh? Right. Yeah. But like, honestly though, if we went deeper, mm. right. If I like the chain, if I think it looks nice, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That, that, that means that there's some type of, social or status type of thing that exactly. is playing in the back of my subconscious exactly. where it's like I want to look nice right yeah and why do I want to look nice well mm -hmm. you know I want to be presentable in front of people why do you want to be pre presentable in front of people well I don't know my wife might be at the store yeah who knows well, I'm <laughs> very serious about my image or how I show up in front of people I show up in front of the world it's true Exactly. I'm a businessman. I never know when my next deal is coming. Exactly. Like you, there are other things that are playing Definitely. in the background. Yeah, yeah. And of course we could say, well, I just want it. But I never, I never think that's the case. I think there's always something a reason deeper. behind yeah. every single thing that we do. Mm -hmm. Every single thing. You're right. You're Even right. the color brown. It's <laughs> like, why do you like the color brown? Because I'm brown. Wait, that's why. Like, Because I'm brown. And I actually discovered I see it every why, day. why I actually discovered the deeper meaning behind brown. And it made sense. I'm like, that's why I love brown. 
Yeah. So there is okay, always. Okay, well, what's the, what's the deeper meaning behind brown? Well, behind brown, I checked it out. Every color has a deeper meaning behind it. So if it's your mm-hmm. favorite color or you're drawn or attached to it, probably have, it probably because some of the characteristics that represent that color represent you. So for example, brown is a symbol of earth. Brown is earthy. Brown means groundedness. And that's just me. I'm, mm. I'm earthy. I'm, I'm grounded. The earth, mother earth. I love to walk with my feet bare everywhere, like be it in the grass and the sand and whatever in the house. I love that. And also brown symbolizes warmth. I've forgotten the other characteristics, but it, it, it was it was very me. I was like, yeah, yeah, that is me. That's why I love brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. What's blue mean? Because my favorite color has always been blue. Oh, blue. blue behind oh, ooh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about blue. Blue, oh, yeah. Okay. Blue, blue is likened to the ocean. So think about the ocean. The ocean is deep. The ocean is cold sometimes, <laughs> most of the times. But blue also symbolizes love. We mistake the color red for love. You know, every somebody sends you a heart emoji and it's red. Then all oh. red was like anger or um, intensity or something. Yeah, red is passion, intensity. Yeah, passion. passion and intensity, and and fire. Yeah, but blue blue is actually peace, serenity, depth, and coldness, and also love as well. Like the love that's in, the love that's associated with the color blue is the deeper type of love, like it's a mm. deep type of love. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's that's me. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. There's always something. Know. There's always something. Yeah, yeah. I think that actually is a pretty. I think you know. I definitely like to go deep. This is why we're having this conversation. Mm-hmm. I get deep about every. It annoys. It annoys people a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, bro, can you just let it rest, please? Like, please, please. give us a break today. No, no, but I get it. Fine. I get it. I, I love going deep as well. I think it's it's unfortunate that people don't allow themselves to go deep because they're probably afraid of what they'll find when they go deep. Remember last time we had the conversation. The last time we we had the video call, I said. I was learning how to swim. Like I'm learning how to swim and I'm learning so much about water. I'm learning about the relationship that I have with water and I'm learning about how to relate to water. So water is neither good nor bad. The ocean is neither good nor bad. If you're on the surface, you could float and you're relaxed and whatever. But if you go deep, it's another type of energy. It's another type of atmosphere so depending on which level you are some people are afraid i've discovered some people are afraid to go deep because they they're they're afraid they might just drown you might Mm -hmm. not be able to swim in those waters but sometimes if you are on the surface you're on the top nothing nothing is able to harm you you're floating you're relaxed you're you know the waves will come and sweep you you go with the flow but when we, we say now dive deeper, it requires more because your lung capacity, you know, your lungs are going to require more from you. Your body is going to require more from you. And sometimes people are just not ready for that. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary to go deep. You better be prepared to go deep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, that is so deep. <laughs> that, that is so deep. Speaking of depth. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of depth. <laughs> like... Because that's so true. I, and I respect all views on this. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a thinker. I'm a challenger. Mm -hmm. Lots of things. Often I'm a skeptic, which I think if utilized properly can be a spiritual gift. Yeah. But I don't, I don't really get upset anymore. I used to Mm. when people shy away from going deep because I can, I can understand, right? I have more empathy Mm -hmm. because there's some fear like associated with that. Mm -hmm. And it's like really self-preservation. Yeah. Self-preservation and protection. Yeah. Like if I, if I dive into this Mm -hmm. in my mind, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll be able to get back up for air. Exactly. Exactly. Well put a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So what do people do? They would rather stay on the surface. You rather keep it simple. That are play safe, mm-hmm. you know, be in the comfort zone. No, exactly what you said is 100% because the truth is it does require a lot. It does require skill 
an ability to be able to go deep. Because when you go deep, you might not like what you see. Because if, think about it. Mm -hmm. What is on the surface is what is seen. What is seen, what is heard, you know, you can perceive the colors and all you see, you see clearly. But what is deep is unseen. And what is deep is it requires a certain level of full self-acceptance. You have to accept yourself 100% or at least 90% or above in order for you to trust yourself that when you do go deeper, you will rise again. There is nothing wrong with going deeper. It is not a bad thing. It is a necessary thing because we, we, we tend to undermine the fact that what is deep will reflect on what is on the surface. So if I don't even know what's, what's down there and I don't even know I, I, I'm showing up in the world, you know, in this way and that way, and I'm, I don't even, I have no clue why am I showing up in the world this way? It's because I haven't done the inner work. I haven't gone deep enough, you know? And I, I understand you when you say you used to be mad when you try to have conversations with people and they wouldn't go deep. I used to be like that as well. I used to, it was, ugh. Until I understood that people react or people interact with us to the level of their consciousness or the level at which they can handle. Just because I can handle deep does not mean that they can handle deep. And sometimes I've learned through empathy and compassion and love to reach them where they're at, at the level where they're at. But at the same time, being fully aware that that's not my style of communication. Therefore, I need to go be with my people, be with my deep people mm -hmm. so I can, mm -hmm. I can touch base, be myself, because there's something about going deep. Go, something about If you're a deep person and you love deep conversations, it is not a luxury to have deep conversations. It is a necessity. You need to have deep conversations. It is a need to be able to survive in this world. You need, if that's how you're wired, you need that. And I noticed with me, like when I would have superficial conversations, simply because, oh, everybody's superficial and this is what they prefer and whatever, it would drain me to death. It would yes. drain me. I will, I just want to get out of here. Let me just go take a walk. And I just cannot stand to be here. And I learned yeah. it's because it's, the, it's the, the level and then the nature of the conversations. It's just we're not going deep because people are not being authentic with themselves. And they would rather put on masks to be able to appear a certain way because they think and feel that they have something to prove. Why? We don't know. Do you think more people need to go deep, need to be deeper? Do you think more people need to go deep? need to be deeper i think they should i think they, i think they should give themselves the opportunity to go deep yeah i think everybody should what do. does that look like the opportunity to go deep hmm, that's a very good question for me the opportunity to go deep begins with vulnerability yeah you have to start there you have to start with being vulnerable and if you look at today's society you look at people vulnerability is actually seen as a weakness like you don't you don't want to show your weak side, quote unquote, <clears throat> because you're afraid yeah. of how people will see you or you have an image to protect or, or maybe even your own perception. But I think starting when you give yourself an opportunity to go deep, you start by being vulnerable, by showing the other that you are human and that you are simply going through the human experience just like they are. Because I always say this, when we look from the outside in, when we're looking from the outside, all I can see is the perception that I have of you. It's probably not as accurate, or it could be accurate based on what I see. And if, if, if you have insight, then that's most likely together with your insight and your intuition, you could have the right perception. But sometimes not everybody has insight and intuition. So that's how judgment begins. You look, look for, you got somebody and you judge them. Oh, they must be this and this and this because they do this and this and this. But until you actually sit down, and have a conversation with them and allow them to show you who they are. And the question you asked, how and where do we begin, is by me first being vulnerable. It's funny how we expect things from other people when we ourselves are not willing to go the extra mile. I always say, I can't ask somebody to give me something that I'm not even willing to give or show up in that way. So if I want somebody to show up in that way, it starts with me. I have to show them that I struggle. I have to show them that I have pain. I have to show them that I'm 
irritated. I have to show them that I don't like it here. I have to show them that just because you see me smiling on social media and doing all these things doesn't mean that I don't cry. Doesn't mean that I'm 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 a happy hundred percent. So starting from vulnerability. Yeah. And vulnerability yeah. takes courage. It takes a lot of courage. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. I have noticed like whenever because I do believe that is one thing that God has called me to do, which is kind of a manifestation of what this podcast has become, mm -hmm. is to have meaningful transformational conversations. Mm -hmm. Not even on camera. Yeah. Like not even on my just in life. In life. Um, true, true. And you do that. You do do that. You possess that. Mm -hmm. I used to do it because that was just me mm -hmm. and that's the way God wired me. Mm -hmm. But lately, I've been more intentional wow. about doing it, even for, with people that I don't feel like doing it with. Oh, wow. That's brave. Yeah, just because I feel like that is something that God has, has called me to. Wow. And I have noticed when I do that, by me taking the first step mm -hmm. of being vulnerable, mm -hmm. it unlocks, like, you know, because people are like, oh, how, how's it going? Oh, you know, everything's fine. Uh -huh. you know, doing well. Yeah, how yeah, are yeah. you? Yeah, blah, yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then I go and I say something like, you know, well, I've really been trying to figure out like this aspect of my life and it's really been weighing like it's mm. been getting me like a little, a little down lately. Yeah. And they're like, really? Well, and they ask the young why or and then I could go even deeper. And then they're like, well, you know, I've been struggling with, you know, and yeah. I'm like, ah, yeah. here we like, go. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now we're getting somewhere. And I know it's it's so true. It's so true. I remember I tried it as well. I tried it like several times and it's work. It's worked. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work depending on the person. Yeah. And that's another that's thing. Another right. aspect is vulnerability. There's the, always the flip side to being vulnerable and, and being open to somebody is that you risk being hurt or you risk being judged. But then again, it has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the other person. Because you're simply just sharing from from the heart and everything that comes from the heart and and sharing your human experience, trying to show the other person that look, we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to appear that we have we have it all together. We don't have it all together. The fact that it, it is an illusion, life is an illusion. We don't have it all together. But of course, do share wisely and prudently. You know, now that speaking speaking of vulnerability doesn't mean that you go around the street and just blurt out everything that's going on with your life and just it requires wisdom requires prudence yeah and also depending on what you're looking for because i've also noticed one of the attributes that god's given me is being a good listener and i always wondered why why because people would come up to me and they would just you know they just spurt out they're like yes. like dude i wasn't even i was just going to buy bread that's it you know and, and, and we're deep and and I asked myself, like, yo, what is it about me? What do I have? Is it like there's a sign yeah. on my forehead that says, oh, good listener, anybody, you know? And I used to be <laughs> mad. I used to be so mad, so mad. Because even not even I could help myself. It, it just came out natural. Mm. Not even I could help myself. I would, when somebody just started opening up and pouring out their heart, I would like, I feel you. I am here for you. I am present with you. And it was an honor to do that. Whilst the person would leave a little bit much better, I, on the other hand, being an empath, I had to learn how to deal with those emotions and learn to detach from what I hear. Learn and actually educate myself, train myself for the fact that what somebody tells me about what they're going through, no matter how ter terrible it may be and everything, and I, I sympathize, I empathize, at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with me. I just listen. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. Therefore, I do not have the responsibility to bear what that person is bearing. I don't have to carry that load. I can encourage the person to take that load, that load to the Lord, because that's my job. That's our job, actually. There's a book, Boundaries. I think it's the second chapter or something. Very, very good book. It talks about it I Town Townsteed. That's his last name, Townsteed. Boundaries. Townsteed. Okay. Yeah, it's actually a series. It's there's boundaries, how to say no, you know, and also it's Christian based, so it's Christian focused. Talking about how Christians, mm -hmm. it's important for Christians to have boundaries and 
you being a Christian doesn't necessarily mean you have to say yes to everything. So it's an amazing book. And then you have boundaries in dating, boundaries in marriage, boundaries in parenting. So it's it's an amazing book. It's like different series, you know, for for in different situations. And I think the second chapter of the book talks about bearing one another's burdens and carrying someone's burdens. It makes a clear distinction, actually. There's a clear distinction. I think it's in Galatians where it says, bear one another or, or bear one another's, or bear, bear with one another or bear one another's burdens or something like that. I would love to really reference the scripture, but I don't have a Bible right now. And the book actually makes a clear distinction that we as Christians do not have it clear when Paul says to bear one another, to bear one another's burdens is not the same as carrying the load for somebody. What is the difference? Mm. Bearing one another's burdens is when, when somebody's going through something and it's deep and it's heavy and whatever. Um, before I learned about this clear distinction, in the past, I thought bearing somebody's burdens was me being 100% there. Like I'm talking about everything, my all, my energy, and just... Anything that they need, I am there 100%. But then until I learned when I started to get drained and I started to actually discover the beauty of what, it, of what boundaries are, I learned that I could still help, still be present and still be there, but it does not mean that it has to be at the expense of losing myself or killing myself, quote unquote. Because it's a very thin line. Some people are just guilty or feel bad for saying no when actually saying no is your birthright you can say no mm. mm -hmm. and you yeah. saying no does not mean you're a bad person you can say no it's your birthright there's a there's a a young lady on social media i love her videos mm -hmm. Uh, I believe her name is Jess Wit or something like that. Ah, uh, Jess Wit. <laughs> I think I know her. On you know Instagram. What I'm about? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and she has this phrase that's so funny to me every time when she's like, a friend's coming to her. She's like, girl, you know? And she's like, mm mm, I don't have the capacity. <laughs> I, don't have the capacity. <laughs> I, watched, I watched that reel. I watched that reel. I don't have the capacity. <laughs> like, no, no, I don't have the capacity. Yeah. Because sometimes we need to be honest. Yo, know, I don't, I do not have the capacity. And another thing, speaking of capacity is, and, and communicating the fact that we don't have the capacity through boundaries, is that boundaries save relationships. Boundaries do not separate relationships. Um, most women, dare I say, or most empaths think, or most pre people that have a tendency to people please, they think that when they say no, then, oh my God, it's the end of the world. How's the other person going to perceive me? I'm, I'm such a bad person mm -hmm. and whatever. So that's why they end up saying yes instead of saying no, because they don't know how the other person will handle it. But the truth is being honest about the situation and actually communicating to your friend or loved one that at that moment you do not have the capacity, you cannot be there for them in the way that they wish or desire is healthy for you and for the relationship and friendship. Why? Because it shows that you are authentic enough to be real with the other person. And you trust that you just simply being yourself and who you are will be handled and well received by the other person. And if well received, if and when well received, then you know that that is your person. The, the, right, per the right people will respect your no and they will support you when you say no, even if they don't like it in the moment. But because... The friendship is that important. They will support you in that, a hundred percent. Yeah. 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 I think there's a really big difference between being authentic and then being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Where like you can be one hundred percent authentic while being vulnerable, mm -hmm. but you don't always have to be vulnerable while being authentic that's <laughs> true 100 percent. you know what i'm saying 100 percent. so like I, <laughs> I could be telling you the whole truth and nothing but the truth yeah but that doesn't mean that i'm going to trust you with every truth that i have true right? that is true so i think we do have to be very like 
discerning yeah. about that mm-hmm. because not everyone is able to steward what you share with them. Well. No, no, not but everyone also, has the capacity. Yeah. Not everyone has the capacity, even everybody. if they think they do. Even if they think they do, <laughs> not everyone has the capacity. And you know what? Just the other day I was journaling and I was saying, I was in a different setting, in a different place. And I was journaling. And when I was there, I was like, wow, I love how being here makes me feel free. And when I'm free, I feel safe. And so I asked mm-hmm. myself, why? Why does this place inspire me to live in my freedom and therefore create safety for me? And I, Where I, were you? I was at a friend's house actually last week. Oh. <laughs> I was at a friend's house. Okay. And I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't always been there. Not all I go and visit, you know, like if I want to just escape and just change a change of scenery. But this time it was different. This time it was different. And I finally realized and understood why that place inspired those things in me was the fact that they themselves, my friend, her, her family, her sister, they live in that freedom. They live in that truth. So therefore, they inspire me to live in that freedom, to live in that truth, to be, to be safe, to be who I am. It's funny how, you know, I used to hear, oh, depend the vibes, the vibes, or the energy. The energy isn't right, the vibes. I'm like, what is wrong with you? What is, what, <laughs> what is this thing with these vibes and whatever? Until today, I'm like, it is so true. Energy does not lie, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Energy does not lie. Vibes do not lie. Certain people have the ability to, to emit and inspire certain energy oh, yeah. and inspire certain vibes. It is a real thing, 100%. And we better be paying attention to what type of vibes or energy we're receiving from people because that says a lot about them. And yeah. therefore gives you an opportunity on what you're going to do about it. Do you stay or do you leave or do you adjust accordingly? So it's, it's, it's very, very important. And I say to myself, because I'm also currently reading the book, The Mountain Is You, I think it's by Brene Brown, I forget. But brown at the end of the, the mountain is you. Brene Brown. Yeah. Brene Brown. If there is any book that I recommend all humanity, <laughs> all human beings to read, I'm talking about read, sit down, digest. It is mm. the book, The Mountain Is You. Because the mountain yeah. is you. And if you don't know that yeah. you're the mountain, you won't be able to climb it. The mountain is you up until now so far with everything that I've read, the chapters that I've read, goes deep. You know, the deep stuff we're talking about? It goes deep. It shows you certain aspects, certain emotions, where they come from, how they show up, and why we feel what we feel when we're going through those things. The concept of the mountain is you is to show you that you are your own limits. You know the thing that, oh, I can't do this because I don't know, no. You are the mountain. The mountain is you. You, you, That mountain that seems so hard to climb and you look at it and it's like, oh, my God, how am I going to get there? Like there's certain things that seem so far-fetched, you know, like it's it's virtually impossible. How am I going to do this? But you can do this. But you got to figure out and you got to understand that the mountain is you. You, It begins with you, your mindset. And if you don't know yourself... It's impossible to overcome the things that you want to overcome. It's impossible to get to to the, it's impossible to leave your comfort zone if you don't even know what you're made up of. Yes. Yes. And this, and this, I think this kind of, it pulls back around to the good versus God idea thing, right? Because Mm -hmm. we've been, we've been going deep on being deep. We've been going deep on being authentic. We've been going deep on being unashamedly you. Mm -hmm. And there's a level of when you talk about the mountain is you <clears throat> there's a level of like unawareness yeah. that goes into this right where you don't realize how much you're getting in your own way <laughs> true <laughs> and i think a lot of that has to deal with not going deep mm-hmm. on you on you right mm-hmm. understanding why am i thinking this mm-hmm. why am i what what is my belief system, mm, right? Mm. What, 
what is my belief system? Exactly. I, I did a video, I think back in 2020, where I, th- I forgot the title, but it was something like losing my religion or something like that. Right. I think it was, I think it was when Kirk Franklin was talking about all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was hearing it a lot of even in evangelical spaces. Uh, I lost my religion and gained a relationship. Uh, like that, okay. Right? And I was like, <laughs> I get what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. But but the point I made in the video, and I think my sentiments would have changed. I was a little younger, and, and mm-hmm. I've learned a lot since then. Mm-hmm. Was that religion isn't necessarily what we think it is when we hear the word religion, mm-hmm. right? We think church. Yeah. We think mm-hmm. a group of people, right? We think congregations. Mm-hmm. We think rituals and traditions. When really religion. When you say you do something religiously, it doesn't mean that you do it in a church. Yeah. You it's something that you do repeatedly because of a belief system that you have, exactly. right? It's intentional repetition. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I work out religiously. Mm-hmm. I eat well religiously. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, things that you do religiously. Mm-hmm. I watch TV mm-hmm. religiously. religiously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Whatever it is, right? We use that word. So when it comes to our belief system, like it's not even about religion. Like, mm. what do you believe as a as a human being mm. about who you are, whose wow. you are, and who you're called to serve, mm-hmm. right? Like, those three things completely shape the paradigm that you live within. Mm. There's something that I talk about called the life, the circle of life, mm. and not the one from Lion King. <laughs> uh, a, different circle, a different circle of life mm-hmm. where it goes belief. So think of like, an arrow of circles mm-hmm. or a circle of arrows mm-hmm. where it's like belief leads to an emotion mm-hmm. an emotion leads to a action mm. and an action leads to results oh i like the results that results re- re- reinforce the belief oh yes right? yeah definitely so we feel like we're trapped in this quagmire, right? Yeah. When it's really a self-inflicted cycle mm. that is going to continue to happen perpetually until you change how you believe. Exactly. Exactly. And this is why I alluded to the we walk by sight, not by faith. Mm. Because I get it. You believe what you see. Mm-hmm. And 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 of course all church people would be like, that's not true. I I have faith because we walk by faith. Faith and not, not by, by sight. sight. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That the 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 essence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah, like, yeah, all, yeah. All this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Let's but, talk about it. <laughs> but we constantly we constantly talk about having a relationship with Christ, yeah, right? Yeah. And we constantly talk about, oh, you have to experience him. Mm-hmm. Right? Because mm-hmm. no one they can argue theology, they argue, argue doctrine, no one can argue your experience. Yeah, no one can argue. And, and but that is the biggest thing when it comes to the word of your testimony. Mm. You, when you experience something, that means that you've seen something in your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I believe it is unreasonable for you to go from this mm. to this level of faith mm. without ever seeing anything. no. It just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense at all. You have to have so, had some form of experience or seen something. Yes. Mm-hmm. You have to have seen something. So when I say we walk by sight, not by faith, I mean that sight is the is the is the beginning of that life cycle of belief. Yeah. <laughs> you start to believe once you saw something mm-hmm. shift in your life. Mm-hmm. You saw something. Mm-hmm. You didn't just take it as it is what it is. Yeah. And if you did take it as it is what it is, that will eventually crumble underneath of you. Yeah. Because all it takes is one chip in your paradigm and everything falls apart. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's not solid. It's not tangible. What hasn't been experienced is, is based on theory. Yeah. Based, based on theory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Completely. Exactly. Wow. I think that's why uh, things like Scientology and, and atheism, mm. you know, the Church of Science can have such a strong foundation in, in believing truth because there is evidence. They have. Yeah. There is evidence. There is evidence. There is evidence. Yeah, there is evidence. Yeah. And um, it's funny. I think there's just as much evidence on the other side. Though. True. You know, it's funny you mentioned this. This actually reminds me of a scenario we had. I had about. A couple of years ago, I, I was still in med school. I was still going to classes and everything. So 
we had this subject with um, pediatrics. So in pediatrics, we would have these trips, weekly trips, where we'd go to a hospital that's like two hours away from here, and we would go see the patients, and then we'd get back to the university. And I remember we were four of us, four or five students in each group that they separated us. And on our way back to the university, after coming from the hospital, a debate was stirred up about the existence of God. And so I just sat down and I was listening to what everybody was saying. One friend was so stern and adamant to the fact that God doesn't exist, that it's just something that they've, religion is just something that's inflicted on people to be able to like control them, control the masses or whatever. And I just kept quiet, listened respectfully, and I understood where she was coming from until I said something and I said, okay, I have a question for you. Lucy is your friend, right? She's like, yeah, she's my friend. I was like, okay. Imagine I am also your friend, but I don't know Lucy. And I come up to you and I say, oh, yeah. Lucy, you see that Lucy, the one, you, your so-called friend? She's this and this and this and this and this. And everything that I'm saying is completely wrong. How would you respond? And she's like, no, obviously it's, it's wrong. It's not the truth, whatever. Like, but how do you know that what I'm saying is not the truth? And she's like, no, because I know her. I'm like, exactly. Okay. I also have another example. Before I came to Argentina, I had a perception about Argentina. One of the perceptions I had about Argentina was, oh, it was a romantic country and all the Argentinian men were roman romantics. You know, you'd be walking down the streets of Buenos Aires and somebody would just pop up with a flower and a rose and whisper <laughs> sweet nothings to you. That was the perception that I had of Argentina or Buenos Aires until I came to Buenos Aires in Argentina, and I found that that was not the reality. And mm. I asked why. No, because you came. Yes, because I came, because I experienced. So it's also basically the same thing. If somebody can come up with a conclusion and say God does not exist, they have their right to express that, but do not inflict the same opinion on people who have experienced God, because it's not the same thing. On my hand, I cannot relate and I will not say that God doesn't exist because he exists 100% for me. He exists and has existed in many ways that are so real to me that there is no doubt in my mind or in my heart that he does not exist. And I shared a few examples of how it was so evident to me that he existed. Yeah, and you know, everybody was just quiet the whole, the whole trip back to the university. Even I was surprised why I shared those examples, but I, I really thought and I understood and I say it, it all goes back to being to the simple things. It all goes back to the simple things. If you know something, you are in a much better position of sharing what you know. If you know something, you've experienced something, you're in a much better position of sharing what you know based on the experience that you've gone through. And nobody can take that away from you. Same thing with the atheist, atheist same, same thing with anybody who's perfect in their arts or whatever. I mean, look at you, you're, you're into podcasting. What, what mm -hmm. sense would it make if somebody from nowhere comes to tell you, oh, you know what, actually, what you're doing is wrong. It's done this way, this way, this way, this way. You'd be like, first of all, you would laugh. You would laugh to their face. Like, what are you? <laughs> Who are what you again? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but uh, respectfully, of course, but because sometimes people don't know what they're talking about because they haven't experienced what they're talking about, which I actually think is very yeah. unfair to speak about something. I, I, I like to call it speaking from without. Speaking from without mm. is very different from speaking from within. Because you know, mm. if you've been inside, then you know. But if you have not been inside, yeah. there's literally nothing you can say. Yeah. I have another name for it that I, that I sometimes use. It has a little bit more nuance to other situations, but I think it applies here. And I call it the informed gospel, mm. where the gospel that you have is one that you were told. <laughs> yeah. or informed about, mm -hmm. not one that you experience. Exactly. There's a difference between the informed gospel and the experienced gospel. Definitely. Um, Definitely. I like that. And I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> this, this is so, this is so deep. So I did an episode recently and the whole point of the episode was, it came from a quote mm -hmm. that I stole mm -hmm. and it says, we are kept from our goals, not because of obstacles, but because of a clear path to a lesser goal. Ooh. 
Wow. Right? <laughs> I said, oh. Oh, my God. Oh, would you, would you please repeat that, sir? Yeah, yeah. So it says, and I forgot the guy's name. I'll put it in the description. Mm -hmm. Or you could just listen to episode 138 of the podcast. And you <laughs> I, I, I could, I could. I'm, I'm talking to a listener, not you. Uh -huh. We are kept from our goals, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. That one speaks yeah. to me. I think that's why it's 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 sunk. It's, it speaks to me because what I, I think it speaks to the majority. All of us, honestly, because I think at the end of the day, like what you said, what I get from it is having clarity about what your priorities are. Because I feel like in this world we have. You know, it all goes back to what you said at the beginning. Like, you have so many ideas. Being a visionary, you have so many ideas of like 50, 60 all coming in, shooting at you. But mm -hmm. how do you manage to get from the, the phase of the ideas to actually bringing it out tangibly, especially as a creative? Because yeah. with every idea, there will be some form of resistance. There will be some form of support. So I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. Blah, blah. But then how do you bring it all the way to the stage of the final production where it's like ready to be released. And I think like this quote that you just shared personally for me, it encourages me to get my priorities straight. Like be clear on just one specific goal. You know, the whole notion of multitasking was boom years ago. But today, today it's like, okay, yeah. yeah. You can be a jack of all trades. You can do so many other things. You can have so many other ideas. But sometimes having too much going on, actually, the, like you mentioned, can give you that paralysis where you're stuck. You, you, you don't know. You don't even know where to begin because there's so much going on. You have so much going on. But until you get clear on focusing on one thing, the other stuff will be done. It will be done if you wish and choose for it to be done. But if we can just be patient enough focused enough on doing that one thing, finishing it and seeing it through, because I think the majority of this world and humanity has a problem with seeing through and finishing through with things. This is a rule for me that has helped me, that, it, that helps me every day, is when I'm working out, I have my routines for the week, for the workout in the gym. Mm -hmm. So Monday is day one. Day one, I have these routines and this is what I have to do. I have to finish and follow through each and every routine right to the end. Then I know that I've accomplished. I have accomplished my goal and objective for that particular session. And the sense of accomplishment and motivation that it gives you, knowing that you finished through, you pushed through every lift, every breath, every, you sweated <laughs> It was tough. Your, yep. your brain told you, oh, no, 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 I, I can't. Please, let's just go home. I could do something much better than this and blah, blah, blah. All the excuses, you literally came, overcame every excuse. You saw it through, you yep. finished, and you're done. Now you can go home. Give yourself a treat on, on your way home while you're at it. You know, so I feel like that quote really spoke to me to um, get clear on, on priorities, you know, and just sometimes not have too, don't have too much going on. Doesn't mean that you're being a pessimist or that you're not being a dreamer, but I think people like me and many other dreamers that are listening should learn to have the discipline of following through with each dream at its specific time. Discipline mm. is actually freedom. Discipline is not constrainment. Yes. Discipline is freedom. Is. Yeah. Yes. We can only have freedom because of boundaries. Exactly. And I, yeah. And this, I, the, you who are listening right now, I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. could be questioning, well, how do I know mm -hmm. which one I should prioritize? Because mm -hmm. I have a lot of ideas and there are a lot of good ideas. Good ideas. A lot of ideas that I'm pretty sure and know will work. And I think I mentioned this in our last conversation where I said what I've experienced and what I've seen other successful visionaries experience is that you don't want to let go of a good idea mm -hmm. because it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but a God idea won't let go of you. Woo! Right. Say that again. <laughs> and when you think about it, okay, 
what is the idea that I cannot shake? Mm-hmm. Right? Because good ideas come and go. You're like, oh, I want to do this thing. And then like a month later, you're like, mm, I don't know. And then you kind of just forget about yeah, it. Right? Yeah. You have all the, and, and you go through life like that. And that happens. Mm-hmm. And someone else might have the idea and actually do it. And it works for them. Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. But God ideas, it's like, I cannot, it's been five years. <laughs> I cannot shake this. I just feel like I need to execute this thing. Mm. And, and it often happens that, and this is what I talk about episode 138, where it's like, we don't abandon the dream. Mm. Yeah. We don't, we don't like say, no, God, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Right. Mm. But we just kind of get like Jonah, like, I'm not going to go the way you said. I'm going to hop on this ship right quick. Do it my way. And do it my way. <laughs> do it my Oh, yeah. Right. I'm going to be Saul and, like, mm. make the sacrifice before Samuel gets there because, I, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, that story always, man, I forgot which, where that is. It's in First Samuel, mm. but it's a story where Saul is waiting for Samuel to come yeah. to bless him before. And he does the sacrifices to God before <laughs> Samuel. And the instructions there. were to wait till Samuel got Ooh, there. But sir. Samuel was taking forever. <laughs> I, I was like, you know what, Saul? They be trying well, to play you, boy. I I feel you, bro. I feel you. Like, I, 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 doesn't, you know, yeah. Doesn't you know, doesn't that happen? Like, even if it's, especially when it's a God idea. You think, I see, you think what, one of the reasons why, what we talked about at the beginning was why, one of the reasons why we, there's that inner resistance when we talk about going through with a God idea is we're actually truly afraid of surrendering. At least I speak in, you know, in my part. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. Yeah. The surrender, because if you look, look, let's just put a magnifying glass on the aspect of surrender. It's different. If I say, okay, Klee, I want you and me to go to Hawaii. We're going to go Hawaii. We're going to go this summer, blah, blah. That sounds a good idea. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm up for it. Yeah. Yeah, but there's conditions to this invitation. The conditions are that (laughs) I will wake you up at whatever time I feel like. You cannot go wherever you want to go. You have to go where I tell you you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. You cannot hang out with whoever you want to hang out with. I will tell you who to hang out with. I will put people in your path who you should hang out with. Yeah, then, and all these, these are, you know, following instructions. Tell me if you're going to still have the same level of excitement that you had when you received the invitation to go to Hawaii than after now that you received the invitation to go to Hawaii, but with these conditions. I think it's the right. same thing also with, with a, a God idea because a God idea, humanly speaking, will restrict your freedom, quote unquote. You are under the authority and guidance of God. It means you can you are not of your own. You know, Paul says we're not of our own. You are not, you can't, you can't just be up in here in, in these streets doing whatever you want, however you want, whether you feel like whether you, you are totally dependent on God. And if you look at humanity and the way human beings we are wired, is that we are addicted to control. Tell me everything, but let me, let me be in control. I need to have something in my control. But when it's a God idea, God invites us to release and relinquish that control. And that's the part that scares us the most because we know, whoa, whoa, whoa. What happens to me if I give you the control? Like, what, what do I have? And, and then yeah. the aspect of obedience, dependence on him. It's funny how... We're always saying, oh, depend on God, depend on God. We have no idea what it means to depend on God completely. I don't think we have yeah. We have the slightest clue. Because when God tests us, yeah. our attitude towards being dependent on him, our attitude towards seizing control, our attitude towards... That's why I mentioned at the beginning that when as sometimes I've heard the will of God there's like, okay, Lord, I, I do want to do your will, but my heart has, has to get there. My heart has to get to the place where I surrender. And it's just not a thing where I'm speaking with my mouth. I'm just not saying, oh, I want to do God's will. I, you know, I, it's a God idea. So that, 
sometimes I've, I've experienced, I've, I've heard many experiences from friends that are missionaries, you know, that have different ministries, you know, they're self-sponsored ministries. And some of the stuff I hear, Clee, it is ridiculous. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it means when God is the one who is sponsoring or God is the one who's behind your ministry. It literally means sometimes you don't even know where your next paycheck is going to come from. You don't know where your next money is going to, you don't know where your next meal is, go, is going to come from. But he does yeah. and he'll provide yeah. and he'll touch people and he'll use people and that's going to humble you. That's always going to put you in a place of humility and complete dependence because you know the one that's called you to this is the one that's going to see you through. There is no place for self-exaltation when it comes to yes. God idea. Yes. There is no place for self-exaltation. There is no place for self-credit because you know 100% I am where I am and I am here today because I said yes to a God idea. And sometimes it's rough, but a God idea is definitely faith-based. You do not lean on your sight or on your own understanding. You lean on him. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about, about faith. Yeah, faith is, faith is real. Yeah. Faith, is, faith is strengthened when you're executing a God idea or you say yes to a God idea. Yeah, I think that's the key word too, is the execution. I wrote down before this conversation what I thought the three characteristics of a God idea were. Mm -hmm. There could be more, but I have here number one, you are not the primary benefactor. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you won't be a benefactor. No. But the the purpose behind the idea is not about you. It's not about you. And the thing is, though, you might know that mm -hmm. or you might not know mm -hmm. because you don't know who the benefactor is. True. True. Right. Mm -hmm. There have been plenty of situations where I've done something just because I felt called to do something, mm -hmm. not knowing why. Yeah. And I find out later, yeah. oh, that well, wasn't even about me. Well, okay. True. <laughs> Yo, you're right. You know? Most of the times, always, it's never about us. It's about the benefit of another person. It's about service. Yes, mm -hmm. it's about service. So that doesn't mean that you cannot benefit. Yeah, true, it. true, true. It, does, it just means that you are not the you're primary. You're, you're not the primary. It's not yeah. the point. Yeah. Number two. It is beyond logic, ration, or common sense. Mm. <laughs> um, if it's per perfectly logical, it's most likely the clear, the clear path to a lesser goal, mm. right? Mm -hmm. that, that we choose. Yeah. God ideas are inherently go against common sense, where yeah. <laughs> you have to have some level of faith. Yeah in order to activate this thing. And that leads to number three. Mm -hmm. It requires dependency on God. True. Requires. Requires. It is a requirement. Dependency on God. True. AKA faith. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the circle of life. Mm -hmm. And we walk by sight, not by faith, or faith, not by sight, sight mm -hmm. right? Which one is it? It's because you do have to have the faith, right? Yeah. You have to believe and trust in a God that you cannot physically see. Mm -hmm. And I want to make clear when I say you walk by sight, not by faith, I'm not talking about what you see in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be something that you see in the world, but I'm more so talking about what you see in your mind and in your heart. Yeah, through experience right? as well. Through experiences, like the physical world, this is at least my belief, mm -hmm. the physical world is just a manifestation of the spiritual realm. I agree. So... I believe the more real reality is actually what we can't see. Mm. And the result of that reality is what we can see. Wow. Deep. So like when you, I say walk by sight, like that could mean literally things that you cannot see physically oh. that you have seen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and that's, that's the whole, like the, the name build your vision. Yeah is it's dual in purpose where it's like, okay, yeah, you think build your vision. Oh, I have a goal that I'm trying to build toward, but it literally means we're building how you see. How you because see. Because how That's you deep. see impacts how you believe, how you believe impacts how you feel, how you feel impacts how you act and how you act impacts your results. Yes. And your results reinforce your beliefs. Yeah. So. Um, that is deep and true. 
the God idea, like I, I to kind of just put a bow on this and kind of wrap this up. Like, I think the most important part is to first determine, and I'll ask you to add on to this once I once I say these. Mm. Determine what idea has not let go of you, mm. right? Because that is a key difference between a good idea and a God idea. Number two, has it fit this criteria that we just said? Yeah. You are not the primary benefactor. Yeah. It's beyond logic, ration, or common sense, mm-hmm. and it requires faith or dependency on God. Mm-hmm. And then number three, the whole kind of tangent we went in the middle of this conversation of going deep in authenticity and vulnerability, <laughs> have you been completely honest with yourself about what you want? Yeah. And then you can decide whether you're going to surrender. Oh, God. Because if we don't, if we aren't perfectly clear on what we actually desire, I don't think we could properly surrender because we don't know what we're offering up. True. True. And now, two questions. Like about this is, I don't think this podcast is enough for for all these two these two questions I'm about to ask, uh, because it's something we need to go think about. Like number one, as you were speaking, I, I listened attentively and carefully, and I do agree. And I ask this question. Are God ideas always big ideas? And another question is, how do I know that the desires I have are actually a part of this God idea? Sometimes can my desires be aligned with the God idea? And I think we talked about this last time in the Bible study. Shout out TKG. (laughs) We said that the closer we, we get to God, the more our desires are more inclined are, and are very similar to his desires. So, and this is something you mentioned as well in the conversation last time, how it's important to also pay attention to what we desire because sometimes it is in our desires that God is speaking to us because the fact yeah. that you like that thing and it's something you desire most likely it does come from God, especially if you have a relationship with him. And because sometimes we doubt, we, we have this doubt in ourselves and also backing it up, you know, with the book of Jeremiah says, oh, the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? So you have scriptures like that, you know, that are telling you, okay, your heart, mm, mm-hmm. don't trust it. But at the same time, you have, you know, David that comes and tells you, oh, delight yourself in the Lord. He will grant you the desires of your heart. So there's that gray area. The question is found in, in the, you know, like in, in the value of indecision, like sometimes, and that's why many people go through this as well. Like, how do I know if what I want is actually what God wants? I know it's in his will. I will probably know it because if it's his will, then it's going to come to pass. But before it comes to pass, because sometimes I think we're waiting on God, you know, to do something. I'm waiting upon the Lord. But sometimes God is waiting on us. And, and, and mm-hmm. sometimes it's like, no, I, I've given you everything, your environment, it's supporting you, your talents, I've given you everything. Now it's time for you to move. And sometimes we're stuck in that place because we're waiting on God. So all these little logistics, you know, I feel personally like you, it takes a while to navigate. That's why we call it navigating. It, it takes a while to navigate through these questions and actually find where you are and even when you are in the center of God's will does it mean that everything will go with the flow does it mean it will always be green grass and sunshine does it mean that you will always have happy days and not bad days you know I think we have a tendency I've heard so many times in relationships when when a couple begins a relationship they're like oh you know this is God's will hey we prayed about (laughs) it blah 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 and yes they get married and everything you know the struggle comes, you know, the years and marriage and life, you know, life happens. And then when life is happening, they question, mm, was it even God's will for me to be with this person? So I think as, as human beings, mm-hmm. we have that. If it doesn't go well, if it doesn't go according to my standards and expectations, it might not be God's will. And many times yeah. that's not the case. Sometimes being in God's will yeah. means you've got to, it's going to tear you apart. It's going to, exactly. you're going to, be transformed and transformation is not always pretty. It's not always pretty. <clears throat> yeah. I can't remember where I heard it, but I heard it recently where I think, I, I think it might've been a pastor mm-hmm. was saying like a lot, a lot of times when we see 
adversity, right? We were like, the devil is a liar. Like, you know, he is attacking my, and he was like, honestly, mm -hmm. I think you need to be more worried when everything's going real smooth. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's a good one. He's got a point that's there. A good one. Like, because that's a good one. That means there's no resistance <laughs> from, you know, like mm. if you're doing something that's according to God's will, that's a God idea, mm. expect resistance. Oh, I love that. Expect Ex chaos, ex ex resistance, and chaos. I love that. Yeah. I yes. love that. Wow! Thank you so much um, for sharing that. That is that's hit, that hit home. That hit home in every way. Yes. Wow. Like, and I think the one thing that you said, like you posed the two questions, but I think mm -hmm. you honestly kind of said the answer when, when expounding <laughs> on it. I think I did. Which was move. Move. You know? Yeah. And I think that's the only way. It kind of is a situation of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Right? <laughs> which comes first, the experience or the trust? Ooh. It's like... I don't know, but like you got to move <laughs> in order to figure that out. Yeah. Because like once you trust him, you'll experience him. Uh. And once you experience him, the more you're going to trust him. Mm. And whoever has been choosing, if you're listening to this right now, you've been choosing the lesser but more clear goal. Mm -hmm. Look, you got to get clear, but once you're clear on it, there's going to be resistance yeah. mm -hmm. and there's always going to be a, a way of less friction. And unfortunately I've done this myself so many times. Mm -hmm. I choose the route of less friction, not because I'm giving up on the dream, mm -hmm. but I think it might be a better route to get there. Yeah. Woo. When God has given us the route to go and, and that is the way that's going to not only make us achieve the goal, but have us become the person who can handle it. Oh yes. Um, the person so, who can handle it. That's deep. That becoming is a whole nother episode. <laughs> he did. Um, oh, I love it. I love to hear it. So I'll ask you this last question before we sign off mm -hmm. so you can have the floor last. If you, and I, I, this is my favorite question. I've been asking this question for years. Mm -hmm. If you had a billboard sponsored by you, Sonia, and everyone on the world in the world was like driving on a singular highway mm -hmm. and they all passed this billboard, what would you want the message to be that they all read? It would be, be the change you would love to see. And that's it. <laughs> be the change that's you want to see. Yeah. Because everything awesome. begins with you. The best thing you can do to support this channel is to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.